Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we're uh, we're going to have to figure out Oh, thanks. Yeah. Time is 
will start. Take it away. <laughs> uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about today my dissertation, which is uh, the title is The Predictable Case of Fairways. Um, the unofficial subtitle is For Why the Fairways Say Me Like Cheese. And hopefully by the end of the talk you'll understand what case is and why it's predictable and why that matters. So a quick outline of my argument. Uh, I'm going to argue that some languages use case to mark rules in a sentence. Some of those languages have sentences like me likes cheese. Linguistic theory has not adequately explained such sentences in fair ways in Icelandic. My proposal is that case involves linking between levels of grammar. The grammar is an optimization and that speakers access multiple competing grammars. And I argue that such a theory gives a realistic picture of what case systems look like across languages. And so the structure of the talk, I'm going to talk about my research question, then I'm going to delve into the theoretical framework, then look at some data, discuss competing grammars, and finally discuss some broader typological implications. So first, the research question. So what is case? Consider these English sentences, she saw them, her saw they. What is wrong with sentence 1B? Secondly, consider the Latin sentence that blew my mind as an 11 year old. Boy, girl sees, girl, boy sees. So sentences 2A and B both mean the boy sees the girl. And what is telling us that girl is the object is the M ending of the word, not the word order. And this is called case, and it's one way that languages identify rules in the action of a verb. So we're answering the question, who is seeing, who is being seen? That's what case is doing here. Other languages, like English and Mandarin, use word order alone to identify the rules. So in English, the boy saw the girl, and the girl saw the boy. If we change the word order, the rules also change. By contrast, some languages that rely on case for identifying rules have relatively free word order. So an example would be classical Latin. And here this sentence, Caesar left legates and acquires for a charge. All four of these word orders have the same semantic content. Finally, some languages primarily use word order to mark rules, but still have case. And two examples of this are fair ways and Icelandic. We know that case doesn't always indicate the rule because the sentence is like her likes Sega, where her is dative, which is usually an object case. Um, but this means she likes Sega, not Sega likes her. And then Fairway's example, me needs friends, it means I need friends, not friends need me. Um, so I'm going to focus in on Icelandic and Fairway's, which are two small population languages, closely related uh, and often grouped together as insular Scandinavian, uh, even though they're not mutually intelligible. Resuming in, why are these particular fairways in Icelandic sentences different? Uh, in Icelandic, I like dogs uh, has a nominative object and has a number of agreement with the object. Whereas in fairways, the same sentence has an accusative object and does not have object agreement. So one, uh, this raises the question, what if the datives are simply objects? And it looks like these datives, both in Icelandic and Faroese, are truly subjects according to standard criteria. And these are some tests that we can do to um, test for subject to. So the central problem is that on the surface, Faroese and Icelandic sentences look very similar, but two major differences remain to explain. One is, why does the object have a different case in each language? And one is, why does the verb agree in number with the object in Icelandic, but not in Faroese? So my hypothesis, fairways rank the constraint responsible for realizing a standard object case above the constraint enforcing agreement with the nominative, and that the reverse ranking holds in Icelandic. So we can see this as, in fairways, the pressure that objects should be accusative is ranked above a pressure to agree with the nominative, and in Icelandic, it's the reverse. So to understand this better, we need to delve into what does realizing or enforcing a case mean? Secondly, what is a constraint? And thirdly, what is a ranking? So this theoretical framework, I'm going to try and answer the question, how is case assigned? And we're going to talk about what constraints and rankings are. My proposal assumes the following, to so linking theory, which is the false theory. And case involves semantics, syntax, and morphology. And the linking between these levels determines which case forms are used. 
optimality theory, which is the grammars and optimization performed by a set of constraints that all languages have, but their ranking is language specific. And thirdly, a competing grammars model, which is that native speakers have access to multiple competing grammars, where a grammar is defined by constraint ranking, and that grammar selection is probabilistic. Let's talk about linking theory first. What does realizing a case mean? Well, I'm assuming three levels of case, um, and I'm assuming the case at all levels is defined by the same binary features. And these case features are based on a hierarchy of rules, of feeder rules. Um, so plus or minus highest rule, uh, plus or minus lowest rule are the features. And so in this theory, realizing case means mapping features between levels in a permitted way. Uh, the levels of case are abstract case, uh, which is semantic and that uh, corresponds to traditional grammatical relations like subject and object. Morphosyntactic case, I assume, includes uh, both means of licensing arguments, so either syntactic positions or case inflection or both. And uh, position and inflection typically match in languages that use both. Um, and finally, morphological case, which defines the surface forms. This is which nominative ending do I choose? Um, so where, where does this hierarchy of rules come from? And how do we know which participants in the verb are plus HR and minus HR? <coughs> well, this comes from a semantic form. So I have here a semantic form representation of the verb show. And the important information here is that X, Y, and Z are variables. So we can replace these with, for instance, job, Mary, and book. And the level of embedding determines the place in the hierarchy. So here, X is the highest rule. And this represents semantic information that's relevant to case. So it's not a, uh, it doesn't involve contingent knowledge, and it's not a conceptual structure. So to walk through an example in English, John showed Mary's book. Uh, but the level of abstract case, um, John is the subject, which is the object, Mary is the native. Um, Morphosyntactic case, uh, because English uses word order, um, uh, the plus HR here refers to subject position and minus HR to object position. Um, in English, since there's no inflectional case apart from pronouns, uh, generally the morphological case will have the same form. Icelandic is where it gets a little more interesting. So we have a two argument verb here um, where the highest rule has a lexical case for data, specified for data. A level of abstract case, again, subject and object. And word order, subject position, object position. Um, but here we have a mismatch between the subject position and the case. So the data case feature minus HR minus LR does not match the uh, subject position feature. So as you can see, some verbs select a lexical case particular to the verb. And in this case, like requires a data pass rule. And Icelandic clearly tolerates these mismatches. So to make this a little clearer, this tree structure, um, the subject position feature plus HR there is mapping to the uh, uh, dative and likewise the object, there's a mismatch between the object position feature and the nominative. So why are these mismatches permitted? Well, I'm arguing that it's more important in Icelandic for the subject to be dative than for the features to match, and that that's the result of constraint conflict. So there's constraint saying preserve lexical case marking, and that outranks a constraint saying features have to match. So this brings me to optimality theory, and this is from Princess Malensky originally. So what are constraints and what are rankings? So in optimality theory, grammar is comprised of an input component, an optimization component, and an output component. Um, the optimization includes a generator of output candidates and an evaluation mechanism. And the evaluation mechanism uh, includes a universal set of constraints which all languages have, but there's a grammar specific ranking. So, for instance, here there's a particular Danish ranking of that universal set of constraints. And so, an individual grammar is a snapshot of a ranking. And therefore, only one winning output candidate is grammatical for that ranking. So if, with a given input, there should only be one acceptable output in Danish for that input. And this, rep this is often represented in a tableau format. So we have the input on the top row and the constraints. And the constraints are ranked from left to right. And the winning candidate is notated by this point in hand. <coughs> Violations are notated by star or asterisk. And so as you can see, the winner does not have to satisfy all constraints. In fact, 
the vast majority of winners will incur violations, uh, but it's the ranking that determines the output. So let's walk through a quick example in English. Does he like fish? Um, so we have three uh, constraints here. Max, which just says realize all input items in the output. Check tense says don't have an empty tense position. And def says don't insert items not present in the input. So in English, because def is right below max and check tense, does uh, it do insertion is the winning candidate. So does he like fish? Um, that this particular set of violations that is the winner and on that ranking. Um, so this ranking yields that output. The other languages have other rankings. So for instance, Norwegian, the exact same sentence. So here, they're the same input items, the same output candidates, and the same constraints, but the ranking is different. So uh, because depth is ranked above check tense in Norwegian, uh, the do insertion candidate A is not the winner and in fact likes he fish, um, which incurs less costly violations as the winner. So why, why are we adopting this theory? Well, one advantage is we can test hypotheses easily by checking if the constraints generate real languages. And since we have a finite set of constraints, we have a finite set of permutations called factorial typology. And with uh, these three constraints plus uh, a bunch of others, we can predict word order patterns in several languages accurately. So the 12 constraints, there are about 500 million logically possible rankings, but this results in only 14 possible output types, four of which are basically duplicates. So we can see this in this table. These are various word order features that are encountered, and uh, we see the various language types that are tested. Um, and it's not surprising that not all combinations are tested, um, though such languages could well exist. And these constraints do generate all known word order possibilities for the inputs, and they also rule out impossible forms, uh, such as pernicious disharmony. So back to the big question, how are the Icelandic and Faroese rankings different? Well, as I said earlier, uh, Icelandic ranks this nominative agreement constraint, which is agreement in number above uh, the accusative constraint, realized accusative, and uh, fairly easily reversed ranking rules. In the factorial typology for this set of four constraints is uh, corresponds to real languages. And this, this is quite detailed, but essentially the important point here is that in Icelandic, the dative subject nominative object candidate wins because of that ranking and those uh, violations. And then the same, uh, the the ranking defines that in fair ways it's the data subject used with object can't be the Okay, so let's look at some data. And here we're trying to test our fair ways and Icelandic data consistent with linking theory and optimality theory. And we're going to look at quirky case verbs and passives. So how do we test this hypothesis? We need to rule out alternatives, first of all. Uh, one which I'm going to call peculiar position or peck pause. There could be a different object position in Icelandic that assigns a nominative, but that position is unavailable for the object in Faroese. The second alternative uh, I'm going to call quirky accusative or quirk act, um, and this is that the accusative object case in Faroese could be lexical rather than structural. In other words, it's just an idiosyncrasy of that set of verbs. The two additional considerations. Uh, so the data will speak to whether agar nom is the right constraint. So does Icelandic allow non-agreement in number with the nominative object? Because if it did, that would call agar nom into question. And then the second consideration is that apparent nominative objects have been reported in Faroese, and that would be problematic for any current theory. So I'm going to test that as well. So I looked at a broader range of constructions than those that discussed in prior literature. I, I gathered new data from fieldwork trips to the Faroes in Iceland and used corpora and my own uh, judgment surveys. Um, and I also used, uh, I ran regression models to test the significance of the results. So let's look at quirky case verbs. Uh, question one is, do the objects behave as regular objects regarding object shifts? So that's testing this peculiar position hypothesis. And the second question is, can the Icelandic nominative objects of, in these verbs fail to agree in number? And that's testing Agronom. So this is the peculiar position hypothesis. 
So as you can see in Icelandic, there's this XP which has a specifier position. I'm, uh, so I'm trying to test whether this normative object has this available position in Icelandic. Uh, that position does not exist in Faraday's. One way of testing for object positions or available object positions is object shift. This is a phenomenon all Scandinavian languages have. And essentially, the object occurs to the left of the negative adverb like not or never. So in Danish, you can say, I saw them not, but you can't say, I saw not them. In all Scandinavian languages, shift is impossible with a finite auxiliary and a non finite main verb. That's from Polberg. Um, and so in Swedish, you can say, I have never seen them, but you can't say, I have them never seen. Them. With non quirky case verbs, when the main verb is finite, so where you might expect shift to be possible. In Icelandic, shift is obligatory with pronoun objects, so like them. It's also <coughs> with full DP objects, so things like the book. Um, in Faroese, shift is obligatory with pronoun objects and impossible with full DP objects. So if the objects of the Faroese quirky case verbs behave just like the Icelandic quirky case verb objects regarding shift, then that would call into question this <coughs> peculiar position hypothesis. Why? Well, we expect evidence that a separate object position exists in Icelandic that doesn't exist in Faroese. So testing this, uh, I conducted two surveys on the Faroese, um, and the results were that the Faroese objects of the quirky case verbs behave like objects of non-quirky case verbs. Um, so with the finite auxiliary and non-finite main verb, it's only accepted with no shift. With finite main verb, pronoun objects are accepted with shift, and full DP objects are preferred with no shift. And finally, negative quantified objects are only ever accepted with scrambled or shifted. And that's what we expect for non-quirky case verbs. So in Faraway's quirky case verbs, it looks like the object behaves just like a regular object. So that looks like it's inconsistent with this pet clause hypothesis. Uh, the second part was to test the Icelandic objects and uh, tested the same word orders but also with agreement and data interveners. The reason I'm talking about data interveners is that Sigerson and Holberg have reported that some Icelandic speakers accept failed agreement when a data intervenes. So it likes me, the books. Some speakers have been reported to accept that. So the question then is, in sentences without those uh, interveners, is there field agreement? And that's the way we're going to test for agronom. So it looks like the Icelandic nom of objects behave just in the same way as the Faroese abuse of objects, with the finite auxiliary and non-finite main verb, again, only accepted with no shift. With the finite main verb, uh, pronouns are accepted with shift, and full DP objects are accepted without and some context with shift. And that's exactly what's been reported in the literature for Icelandic non quirky case verbs as well. So it seems like peck pause is not the right track. There's no evidence for a different object position between Icelandic and Faroese. And then back to this Iger non constraint. In Icelandic, it looks like failure to agree with the non object and number is rejected across the board. And that's consistent with Iger non, but we need to deal with these data of interveners. So here we can see in the red bar are sentences with no intervener, and the blue bar are sentences with intervener. And the very obvious result is that the mean acceptability is significantly higher with plural agreement and no intervener. Um, so even when we exclude the sentences with interveners, it still looks like object agreement is in number is the only possibility. So moving on to passives. In this case, we're trying to test whether the accusative in Faroese is structural or lexical, and also whether nominative objects are ever accepted. <coughs> what about this work act? Maybe the accusative in Faroese is idiosyncratic. It's just a, it's not a standard structural object case. How do we test this? Well, one test is what happens in the passive. So if the subject in the passive is nominative, then that suggests it's not lexical case, and that would be inconsistent with the Quark Act. Um, but if it preserves in the passive, in other words, you get her accusative was liked, um, that would be consistent with the accusative being lexical. So what I found was that there are two possibilities for passives of quirky subject verbs in Faroese. Either there is no passive, or if there is a passive, it has a nominative subject. And that looks like it's inconsistent with the Quark Act. 
So whether the passive is available depends on the verb. So dharma like permits the passive, tarva need does not. And here we have examples of that. Um, so I can see she nominative was well liked, and you can't get her accusative was well liked. Uh, so secondly, we need to deal with these reported nominative objects, and that's been reported in the literature. Um, and one example of this uh, is the passive of ditransitive, so verbs with two objects like give, sell, or send. We tested the passives of give and other ditransitives and found that the fairy speakers broadly accept, oh, sorry, broadly reject passives of give. And in the passives of other two object verbs, the only possible order is the one with the nominative theme first. So you don't get the nominative theme in object position, and that looks like it falsifies this nominative object hypothesis. Um, so here again, we can see in the plot that uh, generally give is unacceptable in the passive. And then secondly, the passives of ditransitives that are accepted, the date of nominative order is consistently rejected, and the nominative date of order is judged significantly better than the nominative across the board. To, to summarize the empirical findings, it looks like the data are inconsistent with this peck pause, the separate object position hypothesis, also inconsistent with the uh, hypothesis that there's lexical accusative case, and then also it doesn't look like there are nominative objects in fair ways. However, the data are consistent with this agar non constraint that failure to agree a number of nominative object is rejected. Um, so, Let's talk a little about properties of lexical case. So we talked about um, preservation and also uh, availability of the passive. And I propose there are three facts that are interrelated. First is case preservation. So this is where the, the object being promoted has the same case as in the active. So he thanked them, dative, then them in the active, uh, sorry, them in the passive will have dative still. Um, case substitution, in the active, the lexical case is optionally replaced by structural case, so me lacks food can be replaced with I lack food. And then thirdly, the availability of the passive. Um, and I'm saying that all three of these phenomena can be explained with the same set of constraints. This table shows two verbs which, in which these properties pattern together, uh, two pairs, sorry, so like and lack. Uh, neither of those have case preservation. They do have case substitution in the active and they do have a passive. Whereas need and be fond of uh, don't have a passive and don't allow case substitution in the active. So this looks like a systematic difference. How, how can this be accounted for? It actually looks like there are two grammars coexisting within a single language. So I'm going to talk a little bit about competing grammars hypothesis. Uh, so the data we just looked at, I'm saying they can be derived by two rankings of three constraints. There's a preserving grammar which generates uh, non-substitution, <coughs> preservation, and no passive. And there's a non-preserving grammar which generates substitution, no preservation, and available passive. Um, yeah. and so how are these grammars selected? It seems to me there's two different types of grammar competition. One is primarily grammatical or lexical, and um, this is factors such as, you know, you could summarize this as internal factors. So choice of verb, animacy of subject, choice of auxiliary, and the examples of that are this available passive and case preservation. There are also, there's another type of competition which seems to involve sociolinguistic or contextual factors such as register or speaker age, and case substitution is a, an instance of that. I'm arguing that both types can be accounted for by the same model. So this represents the competing grammars model, and this is actually exactly the same as the OT model we discussed earlier, but we have this additional grammar selector. Um, it passes the same set, the exact same set of output candidates produced by Jen to the given grammars. Um, and so I'm saying that this whole apparatus is within one language, so multiple possible grammars coexist. Um, but crucially, selection is probabilistic with differently weighted factors. And so this calculation will determine, get, with, given those weights, this calculation will determine which grammar is selected. An example of this in action, 
Case substitution with nominative and the fairway state of subject verbs, uh, such as like, can convey social meaning. The saying I like as opposed to me likes can convey a whole range of different um, properties, such as childishness or a greater degree of the influence. So clearly, social and contextual factors have weight here. And I modeled this using logistic regression, and I split the <coughs> log corpus data into a training and test set. I included the factors of register, speaker age, and whether the uh, verb is old Norse stock vocabulary or the Danish, recent Danish loan word. Results were that the old Norse origin verb uh, is far less likely to occur with nominative, and the younger age group is significantly more likely to select nominative than the older. So it looks like this competing grammars model provides a way of accounting for the systematic uh, case marking variation in a single language. Um, so let's move on to some broader implications. So what does this theory say about languages beyond Scandinavian? Well, there's work on indo aryan languages by David Sharma and Parsky, and using very similar case constraints with some additions, we can make correct predictions for indo aryan languages. And so all we need to add to the constraints I propose are a few constraints relating to agreement, and that accounts for case and agreement patterns in all of those languages, plus historical stages thereof. Um, and so Kaparski's nine constraints, uh, even though 360,000 uh, possible, uh, possible rankings, uh, only 10 output languages are produced, and the other those are attested. And interestingly, it looks like the diachronic trajectory in indo aryan is similar to what is currently happening in Scandinavian. So if, if we look at Icelandic as an older stage, and Faroese as kind of an intermediate stage in our region as the sort of modern stage, that, that's the same kind of trajectory. Okay, so fine, it works for Indo-European. What about non-Indo-European languages? Well, Finnish and Hungarian. In, in Finnish possessive constructions, uh, self, uh, pre-posed self, can be either nominative or adhesive. And this looks rather like the Faroese case substitution. So that variation could be accounted for by a similar competing grammars model between a preserving and a non-preserving grammar. Um, and secondly, uh, in possessive constructions and finish, on one analysis, the, the posse bears abstract accusative when it's pronominal. And that looks kind of similar to this Faroese data accusative pattern. Whereas in Hungarian, the posse appears to be nominative in a similar construction and agrees in number. So here we have me are coats are plural coats nominative plural and that looks more like the Icelandic, uh, the Icelandic ranking um, so yeah so uh, one possibility could be that this is accounted for by uh, the same interaction constraints so to conclude why did the Faroese say me likes cheese well i'm arguing that it's uh, the result of constraint interactions of a typical kind and Faroese and Icelandic have opposite rankings of this pair of constraints. Therefore, neither Icelandic nor Faroese are strange outliers. Their case, mark, case marking patterns are predictable and not quirky. Um, and I'm saying that this model is flexible enough to achieve empirical coverage and give a self consistent explanation for the phenomena. Uh, our understanding of the interrelatedness of word order, semantic rules, and case marking is deepened when we look at these kinds of mismatches between levels. And finally, our understanding of what case can express beyond just identifying rules is deepened because the choice of case can convey can also convey social meaning. And that's the end of the talk. <laughs> the rest of my committee and also uh, Beth for all her support. I want to thank in particular Judith Dagan and Rob Mina for help with the statistical methods. Um, I want to thank Icelandic and Fairways linguists who uh, were invaluable when I was doing field work. 
and also all the Faroese people who hosted me and helped me and fed me and <laughs> gave me uh, all kinds of help when I was there. And uh, finally, also my family and friends for being such a, an awesome support through these five years of PhD. Um, and so now I open to questions. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that the object shift affects uh, prepositions differently than full mm -hmm. Um What do you have to add to your current theory to account for that? Hmm. Uh, so uh, actually, it wasn't prepositions; it was pronouns. Pronouns, sorry. Yeah. Um, and so I do have constraints that account for that. Basically, I have um, so in the thesis I have. Um, constraint object full dp that says the object whatever's in object position has to be a full dp and then there's two other constraints which i can't remember right now but it's basically i can i show that i can generate the same data that angles and Wigner uh, generate for the scandinavian typology of object shift yeah um, so you mentioned that like there's a computer grammar and then mm -hmm. like, different probabilities and sort of design. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there's a computer speaker variability with respect to those probabilities? If, uh, mm -hmm. Because like uh, assuming that like some people like prefer some construction over others and sort of use that to like in like say aspects of themselves like you know construction maybe mm -hmm. would that be explained by saying that you know, yeah, well, that would be a fascinating avenue for research. I think that could could well be true, um, especially given the the broad variation. So, for instance, the looking at the Icelandic data, um, I find that uh, my speakers in my you know thirty speaker sample or something didn't like data interveners at all. But it could be because Sigurdsson and Holmberg say um, one of those is an Icelandic speaker, so presumably for him it's acceptable, and they had consultants. So it would be interesting to see whether the probability of even grammatical variants is affected by individual variation. Mm -hmm. um, so you like the Danish loan words have Right, they be, you said behave differently with respect mm -hmm. to um, the case changes than mm -hmm. the one the other like the North state. Yeah. Well, so it could be that there's kind of a whole set of vocabulary that's associated with older fairies and um, old Norse stock words. So there's also a register. So there's actually some collinearity between register and origin of word mm -hmm. because Obviously, the older words are more formal, and they're going to be used in those type of texts. Um, and a lot of there's this kind of diglossia in Faroese where you have the kind of there's written there's there's quite a big gap between the written language and the spoken language. And so Danish loan words tend to be more colloquial, and it could be that this is also an instance of change in progress where the the Danish kind of features, including syntactic features, but also lexical features are um, kind of biasing the probability of the non-preserving grammar over time. Mm -hmm. When you describe the differences in age and um, the mm -hmm. features of speakers, where does that like the line? Is it people who are yeah. 25 and younger versus older, or is it so that is difficult to do in a blog corpus because people do not say what their ages are necessarily. Um, so one, the criteria, the criterion I use, I tried various different cutoff points. Um, the criteria I focused on were there are uh, baby blogs. There's quite a lot of them. <laughs> so this is mothers putting words in the mouths of the babies. So, uh, like, I like my shoes far too much. For <laughs> um, so I put all of those where it's a child speaking in the younger category. Um, so actually, 
uh, this, I mean, this is kind of a crude model, so uh, it definitely you could do a lot more work on figuring out with larger corpus. This happens with the largest corpus available, so um, looking at more data would be more insightful, but yes. Uh -huh. I just want to follow up because I want to make sure I understand what the piece of data is. So the piece of data isn't that younger people uh, sort of use one grammar and older people use another, but that when people are speaking as though they were a younger person. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. well, that, that's definitely, well, so I think actually, so the younger speakers included teenagers, so it wasn't just baby blogs, and it looked like the, it looked like the, uh, um, Age was still a significant factor in including those. So if I'm not. I'm. Yeah, I would say that that is an option available to speakers. They can, you know, project childishness or cuteness by using that uh, form, as well as it being a more general, you know, versus older. Yeah. Um, feel free to interrupt me throughout this because I may get something totally wrong. But when so when these uh constraints are like switching orders, which they do over time. Uh, is there always a stage when there's two competing grammars in existence um, with different probabilities and then the probability of accepting one like increases until it's switched? Um, or are there other mechanisms that it could switch by? Well, I don't want to say that a grammar has a zero probability. So I might want to say that the uh, the re the search space of possible rankings that the speaker is accessing is limited by various factors, including their knowledge of the whole language. So, if we think about it in acquisition, they are getting the stimulus. The child gets the stimulus, and they are inferring a ranking from the stimulus, um, but. They're not going to infer a ranking, but the, the probability of them inferring a ranking for a language with case that, oh, this language doesn't have case, so I'm going to rank star case really high, that is very unlikely. So, I guess to answer your question, uh, I would say that those rankings are, have, are accessible but have a very low probability of ever being accessed. So, I think over time, it looks like there is, uh, yes, there are multiple grammars access even at the second stage. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I missed this, but um, what was it that forced the objects in Icelandic to have none of the case? I mean, is this like a nonsense rule kind of thing? Oh, um, so that, so. That was argued, uh, there's this case in tiers theory, which is that um, the, uh, there's a lexical tier and a structural tier, and once you've, you've chosen the, the lexical case for the first argument, so then the first, there's a nominative first priority in the structural tier, so you're going to choose the nominative. Um, my argument is just that, so I don't necessarily agree with that, I would say it's the agar non constraint um, forces there to be, it is only satisfied when there is a nominative argument that is agreed with in number. So I'm saying that that constraint is what's uh, biasing the choice of case. So it seems like maybe that constraint is doing then two different jobs, both force there to be a nominative mm -hmm. and then force the verb to agree with that nominative. Is that desirable? It's interesting. Well, so I want to also talk about position, though. So um, there has to be a, um, the abstract case is associated with position. So uh, it could be that there's a max constraint that if you don't have a plus HR argument, um, so, you know, one option would be to separate that into two constraints and say there's a max plus HR as well. Um, so I have to think about that more deeply. Yeah. How many of these verbs with lexical case are there? And if there's a substantial number, is there some way to uh, predict which verbs are going to have lexical case? Mm. So there. Uh, 
in Icelandic, there are a lot more than there are in Faroese. Faroese has, uh, if you look at Icelandic and compare it to Faroese, there's a large, uh, much fewer in Faroese. Um, I think you can make, you can make generalizations about the lexical distribution of which verbs are going to have lexical case, and some of those include that um, quirky subjects are always non-agentive, and um, there are other there's certain thematic rules that seem to be associated with certain cases. So experiencers of data, and uh, there are various thematic generalizations that can be made. Um, but I'm not sure that you can predict because there are verbs in Icelandic with experiencers that are not dated. Um, so you can't just say, okay, the theta rule is going to determine the case. Um, but yes, there are some generalizations can be made about the lexicon. Yep. Just to follow up on that, so, like and lack, I mean, I, I think at least in English, right, like used to be, like, I feel like the, the thematic goals used to be reverse or something. I mean, like, so are, mm. they, are they verbs that have gone through this kind of historical? Mm. That where yeah. like and like versus please or something like that, it was the same. Yeah, well, like, so there used to be a Faroese ish stage of English where you had me like it. And uh, that sort of co that coincided with uh, the loss of case marking. So it was actually hard to see um, what case the object had or if it was an object. And obviously, you can't go back and test something to <laughs> with uh, speakers of that. But yeah, it's. There's definitely, and there's also Icelandic, there's a famous Icelandic verb, henta, which has, you can have both case frames. You can have data subject, nominal object, or nominal object, data subject. Uh, sorry. I mean, let, let's not call them subjects and objects. You can have data followed by not low nominative, or you can have high nominative. Um, there's a bar, bar the experiencers. So which is, which? So is it data? Can you have a data experiencer or a nominative experiencer? Is that what you mean? Uh, no. So the rules are the same. So the data is the experiencer in both okay. cases, um, but it's just the positions swap. Yeah. So if you have to remember, what did you do with help? Was help the next case for? Yeah. So help has a uh, data object in Faraway's yeah. Anderson. Yeah. I mean, because again, I think this goes back to Simon's question. I mean, there are lots of languages, and not all of them are European, but mm -hmm. health is special. So, I mean, I guess maybe in your bigger picture, you know, exactly what is lexical case, mm -hmm. and how do you kind of draw the line, I mean, you know, between it and structural case? I mean, I think I know what structural case Yeah. to be. I mean, which you want it to be, you know, assigned in a structure, but sort of, you know, what is it they're, they're each doing in your sort of bigger case mm. picture if there are generalizations about lexical case? Mm. Yeah. Tended, strong tendencies making that. Yeah, well, so I think that's, uh, so in the semantic form, that is going to be where some of that information is present. Um, so I would, think that there are constraints. I would say I'm arguing that there's also a constraint evaluation procedure for semantic form level as well. So there could be constraints on the distribution of lexical case. So you could have things like uh, experience or data or, well, in that case it would be experience or minus EHR minus LR, you know. So there's some, rep some way of representing uh, which cases are more likely to be associated with which uh, roles in the hierarchy. Um, and then in terms of structural case, I kind of looked at it as an elsewhere. So if there isn't a lexical case, then there, the structural case is kind of the default. Um, but I mean, it's also, it's called structural partly because it's, it's often associated with positions. So I would say in languages with positional licensing, that would be I, I'm not sure how much sense structural case means in line just without traditional licensing. Yeah? Uh, so I wanted to ask about how the computing grammars work computationally and like mm -hmm. whether maybe like that's just an empirical question and how many mm -hmm. uh, 
but yeah. we're testing it. So uh, one one possibility is that like uh, when I'm trying to come up with a sentence, I sort of uh, I sort of formulate it in one grammar, I formulate it in another grammar, and I make a decision then about which grammar to use. So another mm -hmm. possibility is that I look at which grammar to use, and I don't even consider like what what the other options say. And maybe I do that differently on different occasions, or maybe different speakers do it. Differently. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, sort of, did you? Uh, is there more of a story? Is that a question? Hmm. Definitely a fascinating question. Um, I think on this model, I was assuming that the input is uh, kind of fixed. So, um, I mean, there's a universal set of inputs, but let's take a given input, and then there there is a specific set of output candidates that is passed to this grammar generator. Um, so then, uh, I think the question is. Uh, more at that stage when, yes. when the grammars are uh, selected. Yeah. Um, so I don't think, uh, I guess it is in a sense, it, that's a deeper question about what is a morphosyntactic variable. So is the passive, you know, can you actually say that the active versus, pass versus passive are two variants of the same variable or are those like distinct inputs? Um, uh, so yeah, I think that would be really interesting to look deeper into. Mm -hmm. What are the implications here for machine translation? It, it sounds like mm -hmm. uh, before you had a, almost a reasonably simple mapping of case to case uh, mm -hmm. when changing constraints, but now you're adding this probabilistic on top that mm -hmm. could change the grammar. Mm -hmm. Is there an implication there? Well, I think so. I mean, there's kind of a baby machine learning thing I did here. So, but you can do this with, uh, I mean, talk to Tim, so you decide you can learn a lot from <laughs> this. Uh, so, it's, I think that uh, all of that information is going to be useful for translation, especially when you're uh, trying to figure out what social meaning is or what uh, information structure, so like which pieces of information are prominent versus not prominent. Um, all of that information is going to be uh, useful and hopefully in corpora a lot of the time. So.